While we look at this great vintage illustration of a Maori chief, let me point out that this is my second video on the Maori taiaha, and this is a second specimen that I'm going to show you. Quick reminder and or new information if you're seeing this video first, the taiaha was an all wood pole arm that to us is kind of a combination of a spear, a paddle, and a staff. As the picture of our queen here demonstrates, the item flattens out like a boat oar, which is probably what it and many related weapons descended from as it goes down to the bottom. Quote, One end is flat. This is the striking end and is termed the rau, R-A-U, or blade. The other end is carved in the form of a face and tongue, and is known as the arero, A-R-E-R-O, which translates as tongue. This latter end is embellished with carving, and in olden times was further ornamented by fixing thereto a bunch of red feathers, under which were fastened bunches of the long white hair of the ancient Maori dog. So adorned, this weapon was called a taiaha kura, K-U-R-A. When not in use, this end of the taiaha was wrapped round with leaves. This was a favorite weapon in the old fighting days, end quote. And, you know, the person writing this down is kind of a Victorian ethnographer, I mean, still lived within the time when he could talk to a lot of Maori who had used this. So here's ours, and the main feature about it, the main noteworthy thing, is how short it is. It's only 38 inches. Much closer then to 3 feet than the typical 5 to 6. You'll notice on the spear point, the tongue, carving is actually only on one side, and that's not what you often see. Normally, it's on both. So here we go. Below the tongue is actually the head, the way, you know, the indigenous terms describe it, and then below that is the liver or body. Interesting way to break it down anatomically, and this was used in ceremonies as it still is today, but again, it was absolutely a, a fighting weapon. I mean, many, many life and death struggles took place with one of these in the hands. It was also used in terms of trying to avoid a fight. Uh, there was a ceremony or a ritual called Wero, W-E-R-O, um, but one warrior, usually one, would step forward, do a big display of his prowess with the Taiha, and then ascertain those ritualistic part on behalf of the other people, right? The people showing up, visiting, whatever. And then they would do their part to communicate that their intentions were peaceful. And as I touched on in the previous video, uh, the Maori warriors were skilled and proficient with this weapon. They had a sophisticated martial art. Uh, here's another quote from an old source. In New Zealand, the use of the spear, taiaha, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit, had long been reduced to a science, and no maitre d'armes could have been more skillful with his rapier than a Maori warrior. End quote. There could definitely be some variation in the head. Look at this one. It's very rounded, very spatula-like. I know that picture is very low res, but wanted to show you that shape. Uh, here's Tamora Morrison, Boba Fett's father and Boba Fett in Star Wars. And there he is performing with a Taiaha because, again, they have this, um, you know, dance-like martial art form use uh, to this day. The Kapahaka, K-A-P-A, and then Haka is kind of the more famous word for the fierce Maori dance or performance. Uh, but yeah, he said that training really helped him in movies with fight scenes and stuff like that. And these were such a big deal that they could lend the name to a fight, a battle, and even a location. For instance, quote, One Mano Honuku of the former tribe fought with his favorite weapon, a famous Tayaha named Wahaitiri Papa, with which he slew two men. Hence, the name of that weapon was given to the fight and also to the land on which it took place. And this kind of thing might remind some people of like Japanese samurai culture and like one and others as well of course where one weapon itself can be very famous as I mentioned in a previous video on the subject uh, one could be handed down from generation to generation one could be very famous and revered because its original owner accomplished so much with it now notice that our specimen looks unfinished and that might be the case it could just simply be that the carver, and this took months to make one of these, just didn't finish. But then again, here in this excellent illustration, you'll notice that a plain-faced, or a plain-tongued <laughs> Taiha uh, was a certain type. So maybe the maker was going to leave one side plain, but carve the other, and that's the unfinished one that we looked at a second ago? Don't know. Here's the shaft, kind of in the middle, the actual gripping portion. Notice that the shape is kind of undulating. I had read that that could be done on purpose. It was a feature, I don't know if that's because it was culturally important or to help with the grip. You know, it's less uniform and smooth that way. A little more ergonomic in the hand, maybe. I have no idea, but seeing that there reminded me of what I read about. Yeah, unfortunately, this one's got a chip out. 
but wooden weapons of course do not survive as well as stone or metal ones so we're lucky to be able to see this one in such great shape here it sure looks like, I mean look at that bottom half, it sure looks like the maker just didn't get around to finishing the bottom half, bottom relative to our perspective. Let's talk about the actual martial art itself. Uh, luckily it is still preserved and they still train with this in New Zealand. Some of the schools look really cool. Um, but you know, you don't know how much actually survived modernity. It's very similar to uh, karate weaponry, kobudo. But anyway, one guard position, which I won't try to pronounce, was holding the staff vertically with the tongue down. And then from there, quote, lower end of the weapon raised and thrust at the adversary, either as a feint or if the point stuck the person so much the better as it would give the operator time to recover arms and possibly deliver a blow. End quote. And by that, I think he means deliver another blow. And I would have to imagine that means with the flat end. So you pick up the point, which is pointing down, do kind of a quick jab. And if you score, your blade, the flat part, can now be brought into play at various angles with a big, powerful slash, possibly a fight ender. There was a different guard position where it's held horizontally with the tongue to the left. I would definitely take that to reinforce what we said, where the oar side is the workhorse. That's the side you're predominantly fighting with. Again, based on assumptions, because I'm assuming most of these guys were right-handed, and that way you've got the most often used part on your power side. Here's a different kind of technique, quote, He would advance with his weapon at the trail, the blade thereof, to the rear and lowered close to the earth. When near enough to strike, the blade would be quickly raised and the blow delivered. And if it sounds odd to you to have the business end, the part you're going to hit with, behind you, that reminds me of Kenjutsu and Joe Staff techniques, certain ones. In this case here, it's like the tongue would be kind of a boxer's jab, and the blade behind you is the right, you know, the straight right, the power shot waiting to be delivered. I'm going to quote now about a legendary Taiyaha user. I'm going to skip a lot of terms, but I'll try to start with this one and actually say it. Taro Paki, who died about the year 1840. This man was exceedingly skillful in the use of the Taiyaha, and had a profound contempt for all guns. Even at the Great Battle of, I'm going to skip that, he refused to use any weapon other than his Taiyaha, and thus armed, he repeatedly charged, killing many men. He was a very small man, but of such remarkable activity that tales somewhat surpassing the marvelous are told of his feats. The figure this source is referring to is not the one in this picture, by the way, as you can imagine. Uh, just another great, cool old picture. So yeah, when they got into his supposed feats, it involved being able to jump over a broad stream, stop in midair, turn around, and return to the bank that you jumped off of. So very similar to some of the outrageous tales you see in like uh, Eastern, meaning like Chinese and Japanese martial arts. I've read plenty of accounts, even from the 20th century, where I'm like, uh, yeah, I don't think that actually happened. And then again, that's something you see in all warrior cultures. I was reading some Arthurian legends uh, just the other day, and they had Lancelot breaking down the gate to a castle by himself, just smashing it open. Well, you know, that's impossible. So anyway, back to this, when it comes to the supernatural side, uh, what I find much more interesting is what I mentioned in the previous video, where these could be used to divine whether or not uh, a battle was going to go well. And a really powerful specimen could even strike fear and confusion into the hearts of the enemy. Awesome stuff. So that is a Taiha number two on my channel. Hopefully I'll get to see more in the future. Thanks.